But you look so nice. No, a little blouse. But I'm just wearing like lazy parts on the bottom. So that's how we do it these days. Enough catching up. Let's Enough get catching serious. up. Let's get serious. I'm, my name is Francisca Valenzuela. I am an artist and um, singer from Chile. I also have a um, music festival and platform, which is a feminist interdisciplinary Latinx initiative called Ridosa. All of the other interviews that I've done up to this point for this sort of series have been about queer musicians and sort of in honor of Pride Month. But right. I felt like Pride this year has obviously been eclipsed by the BLM movement and protests all over the US, which felt like a good opening to talk to other musicians about other things that were sort of tangential to their process. <laughs> and so I wanted to talk to you specifically about protest and your experience in Chile last year and how it sort of relates to what's happening here in the US because mm -hmm. our conversation right before Nick and I went to go protest was super helpful and thought you were really insightful. Did I say? <laughs> <laughs> so tell, tell us about what happened in Chile last year. In October, the uh, Minister of Transportation came out and said that they were going to raise the price of the metro. And the students came, went out to protest and said, you know, this is unacceptable. And the minister basically had a very symbolic Mary Antoinette-like phrase, which was like, you know, if you get up earlier, it'll be cheaper. So just work harder and get up earlier. This was kind of a symbolic trigger to a sense of general, um, you know, frustration. And by the time the government answered to them a few days later, they were like, we'll bring down the fare for the metro. It was like, this isn't about the metro anymore. This is right. about the injustice that happened 30 years ago. And it's been, a, it's been a, it's a system that's been exacerbating this inequality. And it escalated to constant protests, riots, and then a, 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 a absolute, I would say, police oppression and brutality in a militarized state with curfew and with constant um, violence and acts of oppression. None of, none of that has been... Um, resolved the depth of it is is wild and mm -hmm. the attempt to sort of like form a single narrative around it is is really tricky and, and challenging mm -hmm. I, I think and especially as we're trying to draw parallels it seems to me that there are maybe there's not this history of of slavery which of course is the foundation for so much of what's happening in the united states but this um sort of blatant disregard for the, for the um, experience of the less privileged and, and sort of like a scornful sort of approach seems to be really similar to what's happened here. They're constantly in a divisive discourse. The, you know, the us versus them kind of rhetoric um, is also the way they operate in all, in all of things. Uh, and it's a system that they've benefited from. So of course, why would they even question it because of human empathy or curiosity? What was so frustrating in Chile, and this is what we talked about, you and I before, that energy and that need and that, um, that just like, that, that force of being together in all these spaces, moving towards something was so denied, was, was profoundly denied and just hit and hit and hit. And it hasn't articulated into anything. So what was your role in all of this? Because you were really engaged and, and yeah, really I, driven by it. I've always felt um, compelled to participate. And I think in that sense, when this all happened, I felt, I did, I did feel like this was a fight that that we that everyone had to give and that i was in a position to participate as a citizen as an artist and i would say not just in fighting for a cause and saying these are the issues this is what is being fought this is what is needed but also in amplifying the voices of those who have led these fights and were maybe subterraneously leading mm -hmm. these fights the decision to activate or deactivate or be aware or not is because you absolutely have the possibility to not to do that. I've never really taken the time to understand the structural repercussions of things 
that have been put in place because we assumed they had to be that way. I couldn't believe how faced in, the, in a collective crisis, which is the same as in the States, got like a, a government decided not only to make the, those demands and those needs and those bodies and minds and people and everyone invisible, but to proactively, to proactively invalidate the needs. Mm -hmm. Not only I don't see you, it's like, no, but that's not real. So what kind of advice would you have for people who are, who are, because I, I, I know a lot of people who I feel like want to be involved in this sort of thing, but they're overwhelmed by the enormity of the task that's in the system while also trying to self-analyze. This change, whatever you're feeling, it's happening to everyone else too. And people that are actually on the front lines going through shit, not you. It's here in the States that that happens a lot like the conversation about um, how do you participate, what's your role, which is really good, but I think sometimes it can just be a little bit counterproductive because you're thinking of all the time about what you have to do or what you're doing versus just kind of going out there and being present and participating and learning and shutting up and giving the microphone to other people. The philosophy is important, but action is important. And shutting up and listening is important. I am just a mere participant and observer of these things. I have no truth to say in terms of being in the front line of a you know, social transformation. I'm barely an activist in the sense I have these initiatives and these interests, but I haven't dedicated my life to that absolute transformation in society. I've done what I've wanted. I've been able to choose to do what I wanted. That's, that's a refreshing counter to the frenzy of social media. The performativity of it makes right. you start to feel like, oh, what I'm doing is not enough or like that I need to be somehow engaged in a different way or a showier way. Well, also, if you're thinking about to. that, which I know a lot of, you know, a lot of people are, um, I would say it's because you have a possibility to think like that, but it's not urgent enough to you. So it's okay, just chill out. It's not about you. It's the same thing with celebrity stuff. Like, it's great that people use their tools and their resources. It's, it's imperative, but it's like, in the end, the experts aren't necessarily those that are most visible. They're, I think what's a, an, an exciting thing in terms of what you're saying in transformation is if you feel like you've never been activated this way before, there is an opportunity to let go of those fears that you have in yourself about whatever and trust other people too. And, and when I mean trust, I mean trust their stories and their realities and what has happened to them. And the state is a perfect example of that. As artists and as musicians, I feel like I at least feel an obligation to respond to the world around me and to, to you know, write music that reflects my perspective in that, in that time. How do you feel that it's an obligation? In what way? A good question. I think it's because I am constantly consumed with this idea of creating work that's important and making things that reflect or are part of, a current, of the current conversation, however abstractly and creatively and, and twisted yeah. in my own twisted way but that feels like the only way that i can sort of legitimize this deeply self-absorbed style of work that 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 requires an immense amount of self-analysis and, and thinking about my own thoughts a lot i didn't ask, ask myself the question of like the the importance of what kind of music I wanted to make or how it or how it related to the outside world really until later. What moves me is our stories and truths. So in the end, I think that's been the motor, just writing things that are truthful. And by truthful, I don't mean like all confessions that are 100% true. I mean, that have an, a truthful emotion or component to it that reveals something. And I think in that, in that reveal, there is something kind of subversive and political, no matter what the form. Like all this narrative that may seem social is, is coming from a personal place or a personal search. I think that's a good place to end. I think that's perfect. Let's say goodbye and then I'm gonna take off my shirt. Thank you, Max. Besitos. Okay, now I'm taking off my shirt. Now, <laughs> it's, it's, oh my God, it's so hot. <laughs>